body bulger lasted less than 24 hours after being transferred to that high security prison in West Virginia. Investigative reporter Eric Rasmussen found out Bolger is the third prisoner killed at that facility just this year. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're looking at 20 killers who were murdered in prison. I, I wasn't shocked because I, I thought that uh, Jeffrey Dahmer would uh, end up this way. For this list, we're considering the most notable instances of convicted murderers who met their end at the hands of another inmate. Which of these cases do you find the most chilling? Let us know in the comments. Roger Kibbe, dubbed the I-5 Strangler, Roger Kibbe was responsible for the assault and deaths of at least eight women. His killing spree mostly occurred around Sacramento, California between 1977 and 1987, and he would hunt for his victims along the interstate highway, hence the nickname. He was eventually arrested in 1988 and received an initial prison sentence of 25 years to life. For each victim, Kibbe responded in a hoarse, raspy voice saying, guilty, guilty six times. In the following years, more life sentences were added to this as further evidence of his other murders was discovered. On February 28, 2021, while at the Mule Creek State Prison in California, the I-5 Strangler was strangled to death by his cellmate, Jason Boudreaux who reportedly did it in retribution for his crimes. Shock from victims' families tonight, guys. Those who were directly impacted by Roger Kibbe and his serial slangs. But some of these families tonight are saying his death comes 35 years too late. Gerard John Schaefer. I never thought that I would be that close to someone who was capable of doing those things. Gerard John Schaefer was working as a sheriff's deputy in Florida when he abducted two young female hitchhikers and tied them up in a remote forest. The teenagers were able to escape after he was called away on police duty. After he claimed he only wanted to show them the risks of hitchhiking, he was apprehended and charged with false imprisonment and aggravated assault. While out on bail, Schaefer abducted and killed two other girls, and was re-arrested after their decomposed bodies were found in the woods. Schaefer was sentenced to serve two concurrent life terms at the Florida State Prison, where in 1995, he was killed by another inmate, Vincent Rivera. Rivera was handed an additional 53 years for the murder. When I found out that Schaefer had been killed, it was like a horrible stink had just drifted out the window and for the first time in years, I could breathe fresh air. Sidonio Teixeira. In 2008, Sidonio Teixeira was sentenced to life imprisonment for taking the life of his young daughter and also attempting to murder his son. While serving his sentence at the Long Larton Top Security Prison in Worcestershire, England, Teixeira was attacked by another inmate while working at the prison workshop. The culprit, Victor Castigador, reportedly put a stone in a sock, which he used to beat Teixeira, who later succumbed to his injuries. Castigador, who claimed to have been purging the world of evil, was found guilty in 1990 of the murders of two security guards and was serving a life sentence already. He was subsequently issued a whole life order by the Birmingham Crown Court for killing Teixeira. Donald Leroy Evans. Two days ago, a 12-member jury sentenced Donald Leroy Evans to death by lethal injection. Although he was only found guilty of two murders, Donald Leroy Evans admitted responsibility in the killings of over 70 people. He even led the FBI on a two-day search for bodies in the Arizona desert, but they found nothing. If true, this would make him one of the most prolific serial killers in U.S. history. On August 1st, 1991, Evans took the life of his last victim, Beatrice Louise Routh in Mississippi. He was arrested four days later and eventually sentenced to death. His crimes also resulted in convictions at the federal level and in the state of Florida. In 1999, while sitting on death row, a fellow inmate named Jimmy Mack decided to bring Evans's execution date a little closer. The two were reportedly in the prison shower when Mack stabbed Evans to his death. Nikolai Fifilov. Over the span of six years, Nikolai Fifilov reigned terror on the town of Sverdlovsk in the then Soviet Union. In all, he had a victim count of seven, all of whom were female. Fifilov had served in the Soviet army, and it's believed that the motivation for his crimes came from being rejected by a woman he loved. He was arrested in 1988 after being caught by a senior Soviet official trying to dispose of his last victim's body. Fifilov was in jail awaiting trial when he met his demise at the hands of his cellmate on August 30, 1988. Conspiracies soon arose that his murder was arranged in order to prevent a potentially sensationalized trial. Those claims, however, have never been confirmed. Laron Williams. 
In October 1977, LaRon Williams claimed the life of a sex worker in Nashville, Tennessee. Before his trial, he bargained a plea deal that came with a sentence of 10 years imprisonment. He was still serving his time in 1981 when he escaped from the Memphis Correctional Center. While on the run, Williams killed an additional two people, a police officer who tried to arrest him and a Catholic priest. He was recaptured soon after and sent back to prison, this time with two death sentences. On July 8, 1985, Williams was descended upon by a group of other inmates, reportedly for being on the prison phone for too long. He was left severely injured and ultimately died at a nearby hospital. Daniel Camargo Barbosa Born in Colombia in 1930, Daniel Camargo Barbosa had a pretty troubling childhood. Prevented from furthering his education by financial constraints, Barbosa eventually fell into a life of crime. He began with petty thefts before escalating into abducting, assaulting, and murdering young girls. Barbosa first went to prison in Colombia, where it is believed that he claimed the lives of more than 80 girls. He escaped from prison and fled to Ecuador, where he continued his despicable actions, later owning up to 72 murders in the country. Barbosa was incarcerated for 16 years, but his sentence was cut short just five years in when he was killed by another inmate, who happened to be one of his victim's nephews. Lenko Latkov Between 1999 and 2000, Lenko Latkov committed three murders in the Khaskovo province of the People's Republic of Bulgaria. All of his victims were elderly women, although he also targeted young boys and girls, who he apparently only assaulted. Latkov was suspected of carrying out three other murders, but none of them was confirmed before his death. Prior to his trial, he first received psychological evaluations, before being transferred to a prison where he was held. Latkov never got the opportunity to answer for his crimes. On the 13th of September 2003, his cellmate, Sami Beram Abtullah, who had been locked up for attempted murder, succeeded in killing him following a heated argument. Elio José Muniz Filho Elio José Muniz Filho, or El Niño as he was more commonly called, was imprisoned for 201 years for the deaths of 65 people. Born and raised in Pernambuco, Brazil, El Niño was a vigilante killer who sought to, quote, clean up the city by taking out people he deemed to be evil. No matter how good his intentions may have been, this was considered a crime in the eyes of the law, and he was arrested in 1998. El Niño's actions seemed to have won him favor among the residents of the town, as over 3,000 people reportedly signed a petition demanding his release. While serving his sentence, however, he was violently attacked by three inmates and later died of his injuries at a hospital. Artur Kitaev Just as the Soviet Union fell in the early 1990s, Artur Kitaev embarked on a spree of sex crimes and murders. This earned him the nickname Last Sex Maniac of the USSR. During that period, Kitaev had gotten a job as a driver for an auto company. With his official vehicle, he preyed on young female hitchhikers around the city of Smolensk, claiming the lives of six of them. Kitaev was arrested in July of 1992 and sentenced to death two years later, although this was eventually commuted to a life term. The Russian killer remained in prison until September 2019, when an argument with his cellmate ended in a brutal attack that ultimately resulted in Kitaev's demise. Thor Ness Christensen. Thor Christensen terrified a town. No conscience whatsoever. Zero. Born in Denmark, Thor Ness Christensen was brought to the U.S. by his parents at the age of five. Although a bright student in high school, Christensen later lost interest in his studies and dropped out to work at a gas station. Around this time, he began harboring despicable thoughts, which he then made a reality after stealing a pistol from a friend. He was responsible for the deaths of four women, but his murderous spree came to an end when his intended fifth victim survived the ordeal and led the police to him months later. This guy thinks what he did was all right. While serving a life sentence at Folsom State Prison, Christensen was wounded in the exercise yard by an unidentified prisoner and later succumbed to his injuries. Jose Antonio Rodriguez Vega Dubbed El Mataviejas, which translates to the old lady killer in English, Jose Antonio Rodriguez Vega reigned terror on elderly women in Cantabria, an autonomous community in Spain. In the span of just eight months, Rodriguez Vega wormed his way into the hearts and homes of several women in the area and took the lives of at least 16 of them. Upon his arrest, Rodriguez Vega confessed to the crimes, but later recanted his confession during his trial. Regardless, he was found guilty and sentenced to 440 years in prison. 
After serving only a fraction of his sentence, Rodriguez Vega met his end at the hands of two inmates at his prison in Salamanca, who brutally attacked him in the common area. Leopold Zion The crimes of Leopold Zion are pretty tragic not only because they involve the deaths of four people and the assault of many others, but because a large number of them could have been prevented. Zion had been convicted twice of crimes involving assault, but in both cases, he was released early by a parole board. He later succeeded in cutting short the lives of four young boys before he was arrested again, this time for good. Zion was convicted of just one murder and received the death penalty, although this was later commuted to a life sentence. He was attacked and killed in prison by a fellow inmate, who was acquitted of the crime on the basis of insanity. Leroy Martin Born and raised in Gaffney, South Carolina, Leroy Martin lived a seemingly normal life. He worked in a textile mill and had a wife and three children. Behind that facade, though, was a maniac who rained terror on women in the area and was responsible for the deaths of four people. And I was getting a little eerie feeling as we got deeper in the woods and uh... Finally, one of the deputies said, here she is, and she was covered up with some brush. After placing two calls himself to a newspaper editor, Martin was spotted close to a crime scene by two local residents and was later arrested by police. You tell the sheriff his boys better catch me real soon or I'm going to take me another one. Why don't you just turn yourself in? Nah, y'all going to have to hunt me down and shoot me dead like the dog I am. He was sentenced to four consecutive life terms, but only served about four years before he was put out of his misery by another inmate at the Central Correctional Institution in South Carolina. Part of him wanted to be caught. I think another part of him enjoyed the publicity. He would get up every morning and go down to a local cafe and and get copies of all the papers and read and talk about the strangler. Charles Schmidt. National media pounced, including Playboy and Life magazine, all to see the man, the murderer, with a personality bigger than life. The Pied Piper of Tucson, Charles Schmidt was a serial killer who claimed the lives of three young ladies in the 1960s. Schmidt was known for hanging out with a group of teenagers in the Tucson area, and when he wanted to know what taking a life would feel like, he sought his victims within that group. It was May 31st, 1964, when Schmidt decided to fulfill a longtime desire to see what it would feel like to kill. In the end, it was one of those same friends who was instrumental in helping the police build a winning case against him. Richie Bruns got probation and was sent to Ohio. So he was so jittery, he called his father and told him all about what he knew about Schmidt and the deaths. After successfully escaping from the Arizona State Prison in 1972, Schmidt was recaptured and sent back, where he met his end just three years later in a horrific attack by two other inmates. James Whitey Bulger. At the age of 14, Bulger had his first brush with the law, arrested and setting up a lifetime of being on the wrong side of the law. Once the most wanted fugitive in America, James Whitey Bulger was an infamous mob boss who controlled the Winter Hill Gang in Somerville, Massachusetts. He also worked as an FBI informant for many years, which, unsurprisingly, did not make him many friends among his criminal associates. Bulger lived as a fugitive for 17 years, but was finally arrested in 2011 and handed two consecutive life sentences for his notorious crimes, including murder. Whitey Bulger was found guilty on 31 counts, including both racketeering charges, and was found to have been involved in 11 murders. He bounced around multiple prisons before being sent to the United States Penitentiary in Hazleton, West Virginia on October 29, 2018. In less than 24 hours, Bulger was ambushed by several inmates and left for dead in an unrecognizable state. Investigative reporter Eric Rasmussen found out Bulger is the third prisoner killed at that facility just this year. Donald Harvey. While working as a hospital orderly in Ohio and Kentucky, Donald Harvey was responsible for the deaths of a self-proclaimed 87 people. He was quite bizarre and on certain levels raised some doubts as to whether or not this guy was reciting some sort of fantasy. Harvey employed several methods in what he deemed as a mercy killing of his patients, including the use of poisons, suffocation, and withholding essential medications. They do narrow the list to 10 possible victims. All died of illnesses that could be a cover for poisons like arsenic a substance found in large quantities at Harvey's apartment. He pleaded guilty to 37 murders to avoid the death penalty and was sentenced to life imprisonment. 
But when you describe yourself as an angel of death, chances are you're bound to get a taste of your own medicine at some point. This came in the form of James Elliott, a fellow inmate at the Toledo Correctional Institution in Ohio, who descended upon Harvey, being familiar with his crimes. He placed himself in that position. I, I really don't have much compassion for him. He's, um, I said back then, and I, I'd say today, if he ever had gotten out, he would have continued to kill people. Richard Loeb. I think that the murder said something to people about American society. This was seen as a culmination of trends that were dangerous, that were immoral. Richard Loeb and Nathan Leopold were two extremely intelligent students born to wealthy parents and fantasized about committing the perfect murder. Wealthy, well-educated teenagers who had done it, they said, for the sheer thrill. They found their victim in the young Bobby Franks, who paid the ultimate price on May 21st, 1924. The two got rid of the body, but mistakenly dropped a pair of eyeglasses at the scene, which were traced back to Leopold. They found that only three pairs of eyeglasses with that hinge had been sold in the Chicago district. They managed to evade the death penalty and were sentenced to life imprisonment instead. But while Leopold maintained a stellar record through his sentence and was eventually granted parole in 1958, Loeb's story took a gruesome turn. He met his end at the hands of another prisoner at the Stateville Penitentiary in Illinois, who viciously attacked him in the shower. Albert DeSalvo. They were young and old, black and white. As the number of victims grew, police became more and more frustrated. 1960s Boston, Massachusetts was terrorized by two criminals. One dubbed the Boston Strangler, who killed 13 women, and the Green Man, who broke into women's homes and assaulted them. The grisly headline-grabbing crimes had some comparing the Boston Strangler to Jack the Ripper. As police launched an investigation into the Green Man's activities, they were pointed towards Albert DeSalvo, whom they arrested and charged with the crimes. While in custody, DeSalvo confessed to also being the Boston Strangler. But due to a lack of physical evidence, he was only tried for the Green Man allegations. DeSalvo was serving a life sentence when he died after being wounded by another inmate in the prison infirmary. Decades later, DNA evidence obtained from one of the victims would prove that DeSalvo was, in fact, the Boston Strangler. It would appear to definitively determine, in fact, that Albert DeSalvo was the killer of Mary Sullivan. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer was responsible for killing more than a dozen people. The majority of those murders happened in an apartment near the Marquette campus. One of the most infamous serial killers to ever walk the earth. Jeffrey Dahmer was responsible for the deaths of 17 young men. His spree came to an end in July 1991, when an intended victim escaped from Dahmer's apartment and led the police back to him. He pleaded guilty to all the charges leveled against him and received 15 consecutive life sentences in Wisconsin and an additional one in Ohio. In prison, Dahmer was reportedly unremorseful for his crimes, which reportedly infuriated his fellow inmate Christopher Scarver resulting in an attack in the prison gym that left Dahmer dead. To many, including Dahmer's own attorney, it comes as little surprise. I, I wasn't shocked because I, I thought that uh, Jeffrey Dahmer would uh, end up this way. Scarver also killed Jesse Anderson, another convicted murderer, who just happened to be in the gym at the same time. At his first court appearance, Scarver entered the courtroom singing. Rain or shine, sharing your dreams. 